Morning, my name is Ben Warrender. It's great to be with you today. And as we come up to Easter, we're focusing on some of Jesus' final prayers. And this week, we're looking at Matthew 27, 46. Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm going to start by talking about Noel Fellows, a man who felt he was forsaken by people, by justice, and even the police with whom he served. Forsaken means to abandon, to turn away, to withdraw from. In 1970, Fellows was a 22-year-old ex-policeman working as a taxi driver when he was arrested and charged with the manslaughter of an elderly coin collector. Fellows always claimed that he'd never met the man. He proclaimed his innocence, but he was sent to prison. And as an ex-policeman, he suffered at the hands of the other prisoners. After four years of his seven-year sentence, he was released on parole, got married and set up a business and became a Christian. But the legacy of his wrongful conviction carried on until 1984, when a well-known criminal confessed to the murder. When the case was reopened in 1985, Fellow's conviction was overturned and he was found not guilty of the crime. Lord Lane, in his summing up, of the, at the hearing, described it as a clear miscarriage of justice. So today we're going to look at two seemingly forsaken people who on the face of it were forsaken. It appears to be a miscarriage of justice. Jesus Barabbas and Jesus Christ, a case from about 2,000 years ago. And I want to draw out three things. When Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He came to fulfil scripture. Jesus paid the price for the sin of the world. And Jesus wasn't forsaken and we don't have to be either. So we're going to start by reading Matthew 27, 15. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who was called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. And while Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent them this message. Do not have anything to do with this innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and have Jesus executed. Which of these two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. And in verse 35, when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And then we come to verse 46. One of the final things that Jesus cries out on the cross. And it says this, at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm just going to pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I, I pray that as we unfold these scriptures, that you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit and show us more truth about you. And how we can apply it in our lives. In Jesus name. Amen. So let's start by looking at the trial earlier in chapter 27. It would appear there are three places for execution. Known as the crucifixion. And two of those places were already taken by local criminals. And there is one place left. And the judge at that time has identified two men to take the final place. The first man is Jesus Barabbas 
and the other man is Jesus Christ. So what do we know about Jesus Barabbas, more commonly known as Barabbas? By all accounts, he'd been in custody for some time. He was a well-known criminal, well-known in the court system, well-known to local people. He was a dangerous criminal, he was a murderer, and he'd been involved in some uprisings against the Romans. You know, these were serious crimes. And the second man is Jesus Christ. And Matthew records that he made no plea to his charge of being king of the Jews. That was his crime. And Pilate's wife pleaded with her husband, saying he's an innocent man. And in Matthew 27, 27, Pilate himself says, what crime has this man committed? All the evidence shows that Jesus had done absolutely nothing wrong. And it's recorded in Matthew that the crowd of people who stood in judgment had been given the choice of a criminal or an innocent man. And reading this at face value, it appears they chose Jesus, who was innocent, to be condemned and Barabbas to go free. The conditions before Jesus' death are, are distressing. Verses 26 to 32 say he was flogged, most likely with four or five uh, throngs of leather, interwoven with bone and lead. A punishment in itself that would have killed some people. He was stripped, his clothes taken, a crown of thorns placed on his head. He was mocked, he was beaten, he was spat at and then led off to be crucified. So the first thing that we need to understand is that, that Jesus came to fulfil scripture, what is written in the Bible. When, when Jesus cried out those words from Matthew, he was quoting Psalm 22.1. It was written by King David of Israel. And there are remarkable similarities between this psalm and Jesus' crucifixion. In both Matthew's account and Psalm 22, they both describe people mocking and hurling insults. They both quote the exact words. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. They both also quote, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. But what is even more remarkable is that Psalm 22 was written some a thousand years before Jesus died. It would have been impossible for King David to know what would happen on the cross unless God himself had revealed it to him. The details will be too precise. There will be too much information for it to be a coincidence. If God had revealed this to King David, it can only mean one thing. That Jesus had come to fulfil what was in Psalms and other prophecies in the Bible. And not only did Jesus know this was going to happen, but he chose to do this. The crowd hadn't chosen Barabbas. Jesus had chosen to take his place. Matthew stresses throughout his writings that Jesus is the Messiah, the Saviour that was predicted in the Old Testament. The second thing that we can know is that Jesus paid the price for the sin of the whole world. As Jesus hung on the cross, he would have been in absolute agony. He was thirsty, parched with thirst. His flesh ripped open. Nails through his wrists and his ankles. Bones out of joint, struggling to breathe, only able to push himself up against the, 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 ra the, the nails in his wrist and ankles for a, a momentary breath to so just slump down again in agony. And yet Jesus doesn't say, my God, my God, why are you hurting me? He says, my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? The Son of God at that moment, for the first and only time was feeling separation from the Father. 
the separation of the sin on the world laid on him. Jesus had an eternal relationship with the Father and he had never experienced separation before or since. This was the only time in the Bible that, that Jesus refers to his Father as my God. On the cross, Jesus identified with our sin. He felt the sin of all the world and the barrier that it can create between people and God. 1 John 2.2 2 says this, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only ours but the sins of the whole world. That is amazing, absolutely amazing what Jesus did for us. Only this week we have seen a terrible report of systematic abuse within football. It happened over many years. We've seen over the last few weeks how a woman was kidnapped and murdered. There are all kinds of crimes and wrongdoing. And Jesus took all this on himself. Jesus took every bad thing, past, present and future. Those remembered and those forgotten. Those in public and those that are hidden. And those that we're not even aware of. And the Bible describes that at 12 noon until 3 in the afternoon there was darkness. When the Father who is holy and in whom no bad thing or frailty is found, turned away from his innocent son. A perfect holy God demands justice for all the wrong that we have done and Jesus took our place. The Bible says he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. God was not just an unjust God punishing an innocent party. But as Paul says in Corinthians, God was in Christ. He was our substitute. The Bible says in Romans 5.1, through Jesus we are justified. Justification is a, a legal term. When you go to court and you're acquitted, you are justified. So we are justified through Christ. And shortly after this, as Jesus cried out, it is finished and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain in the temple, which separated the, the most holy place from the holy place, was torn in two from top to bottom. The curtain was one inch thick and previously only the, the high priest could go there and once a year, to make a sacrifice. Previously the access was for VIPs only and suddenly at that moment everybody had access to the presence of, of the God. The Bible says in Hebrews without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Jesus' blood was ultimately shed for our forgiveness. The final thing I want to draw out is this, that Jesus was not forsaken or abandoned and we don't have to be either. At the end of Psalm 22 there is hope and triumph. It says this in Psalm 22, 24. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him but listened to his cry for help. Jesus wasn't and never had been forsaken or abandoned. Let me say that again. Jesus wasn't, never had been forsaken or abandoned. For a time, he fully identified with the wrongdoing and the guilt of every single person that ever lived. For a time, he felt the absence of the presence of his father 
But three days later, in a moment forever remembered in history, Jesus is raised from the dead. And 2,000 years later, 2.4 billion people profess that Jesus is their Lord and their Saviour. So the question, I guess, is this. Why was Barabbas allowed to go free? Why is that included in this account? He was a man imprisoned for the crimes that he did commit. And suddenly he's set free. There can only be one reason. Jesus loved Barabbas. He loved him. He didn't abandon him. He didn't forsake him. But justice had to be done. There was a place that had to be filled on the cross. It was Barabbas' place. And Jesus took his place. And as much as Jesus did that for Barabbas, he did it for you and he did it for me. It's the greatest thing, it's the greatest act of love that one person could ever do. John 15, 13 says this, Greater love has no man than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. Jesus loved Barabbas no matter what he'd done. He deserved justice and Jesus shows him mercy. He deserved death and Jesus gave him life. His debt was enormous and Jesus paid it. God, God demands justice, but in his love, he provides the solution. Justin Holcomb says this, Grace is the opposite of karma, which is all about getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. And that is, the, that is the grace of God, that we get what we don't deserve in his love. So Jesus came to fulfil scripture. Jesus came to pay the price for the sin of the world. And Jesus wasn't forsaken. And we don't have to be either. So as I come into land, I just want to leave you with these two thoughts. Has there ever been a time in your life where you feel that pain and you think, I was forsaken? A moment where you feel abandoned or turned away from? It could be now, it could be a time in the past. But it's at his time of greatest despair. Barabbas met Jesus. At the time of, of Jesus' greatest despair, he trusted in the Father. And you need to know this. Wherever you're at today, wherever you're past, you have not been forsaken. You have not been forsaken. God hears your cry for help. You may have been experiencing a sickness, a worry, a loss, financial hardship, but you are not alone and you are not forgotten. Barabbas shows that there is nobody who is beyond the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. You know, maybe you feel a loss or an injustice in the past that may be very, very painful, but perhaps today, you need to see that thing nailed to the cross. You know, maybe you need to picture yourself handing that thing over to Jesus. Saying, Jesus, will you take this from me? And in a few moments we're going to pray and maybe that's something that you can do as we pray. And maybe you have never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you're not fully committed to him. And maybe today that's something that you want to do. 
And the second thing I want to say is this. Let God use the times that you have felt forsaken. I wonder what happened to Barabbas. There's no recorded time where he, he goes to Jesus, thank you so much for what you've done. There's nothing in any of the Gospels that says he went back to his village and told all the people of what Jesus had done. But I tell you what, Jesus still willingly went to the cross. That's God's grace. But Jesus' pain was not wasted. Returning to, to where we started with Noel Fellows, here was a man that had experienced a terrible miscarriage of justice. He felt abandoned, forgotten, broken and forsaken. But Jesus didn't waste Noel Fellows' pain. Since becoming a Christian after his release from prison, his conviction was quashed. He was justified. And since then he has written and pioneered uh, life management programmes to help people get free of addiction. He's set up discipleship programmes and homeless programmes. He's become a powerful speaker. And uh, when he speaks, there's a real sense of the Holy Spirit moving as he shares his testimony. And my question is this, has there been a pain or loss in your life that Jesus can use to help other people? You see, you can uniquely identify with people because of your experiences. And you can do that because Jesus has identified with you. At the end of his biography, Killing Time, Noel Fellows says this. It'd be nice to say that since becoming a Christian, that everything's been rosy in the garden. But I've had to put my faith on the line many, many times. Often God seems to be taking me apart bit by bit and rebuilding me. It was then that I felt like throwing in the towel. But through the peaks and the troughs of my Christ experience, God has never left me. Many times he's stretched out his hand to pick me up, to strengthen me in a time of weakness and set me on the right path again. God's Holy Spirit is working today through reconciliation, healing, restoring people's broken lives. And then Fellows concludes with this. Perfect justice, truth and reality are only found in Jesus Christ. Through him, all things are possible. Amen. I'm going to finish by praying. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you died for me on the cross. Thank you that we are justified through what you did on the cross. And I pray today that you would show me areas of my life that perhaps I haven't fully given to you, times when I felt forsaken, perhaps times that are too painful to, to think about Never mind talk about. And as, as I think of them now, Lord, I just give them to you. I say, will you, will you take them? And will you replace them with your love? And will you bring healing? And will you help me to know how I can use my experience to help other people so that my pain isn't wasted. In Jesus' name. Amen. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you're watching this and thinking, I need something because I can't carry on like this. This is too painful. 
I want something like no fellows had. I want a fresh start. You can pray with me right now. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I have messed up. I know that I have done things that are wrong. And I pray right now that you would forgive me. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you rose from the dead. And I pray that you will be the Lord of my life from this day forward. Please fill me today with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen.